Galveston. I've been there about 14 years. My co-worker here, Ryan Weiss, he's the prescribed fire specialist. He's been there about three or four years. And his job is to write out the prescribed burn plans for our refuge. Uh, this, this talk's not going to be long. I'm going to let the bill busting do the talking mostly. But I'm going to just go into the floor, during and after. And when we start using the bail bond, bail buster, and bail bond. Okay. And uh, some of the results we've been getting. Uh, we came up with this idea mostly because these units we're using them on, they're, they're satellite units, and they're, they're quite a ways away, about 45 minutes to an hour drive. And so we don't have the luxury of being next door and watching this unit all the time, seeing what's coming up. A lot of times, a lot of our people don't visit that unit for at least a year. I try to get on get to these units about at least twice a month, but it, along with everything else during the summer, you know, it's, just, it's a hassle. So we want to go with something maybe that can do the job while we're gone and save us a little bit of time because we don't have a lot of personnel doing this and we, now we don't have a lot of money. So um, our idea was to go to, Na to uh, the Nash Prairie, the people who run it, and they, the Nash Prairie is about, I, I don't want to use the word pristine, pristine too much, but uh, it's about as close as you're going to get to a prairie, ideal prairie, what you want out here along the coast. And um, we got this idea of one of our biologists, Mike Lang, he said, well, why don't we, they're, they're haying, and this hay contains a lot of great grasses, great forbs, a lot of diversity in it. Why don't we just buy hay from them, go out there, use the bale buster, we borrow from that water and wildlife refuge, spread it out, and let's see what happens. The, that was a, I thought that was a great idea, but there's gonna, there was a certain amount of preparation before we had to do that. For one, when we get this land, we don't usually buy prairie, and this land was a consequence of us buying bottomland hardwoods. The prairies were attached to the bottomland hardwoods we bought. Our, most of our money is for acquiring land is for bottomland hardwood. But fortunately, we got these two prairies along with it. I'm going to talk about the Buffalo Creek Prairie, which is between Bowling and Damon, or Guy, and the uh, Eagle Nest Lake Prairie, which is about five miles east of Eagle Nest, right, um, the Nash Prairie. And so when we get these prairies, we get them from these um, branchers, and it's what you think. These, a lot of these prairies are degraded. They're hurting. They're overgrazed. They're full of they're full of lots of uh, non-native plants. This is an Ahmed non-native, this is annual which is native, but it increases with cattle grazing, and it's un unpalatable to them, so it starts increasing. But what, what I found on the Buffalo Creek Prairie, if you'll recognize that, deep-rooted sedge, tons and tons of deep-rooted sedge, many, many, many acres, even on the uplands, it tends to favor a little bit wetter soils, but this thing was creeping up into the uplands. So we had a prayer, and there's other, other ones, rat tail smut grass. This is what I picked along here. Um, Dallas grass and daisy grass. I mean, I'd have to say just from looking observa observations five years ago, we had probably 5% native dwarves and grasses and about 90 to 95% of these type of grasses are including the grass. So we got the cattle. When we get when we get the land, we take the cattle off. No, no more cattle. And so we we decided we were needed to burn it. We were going to remove a lot of the thatch layer and make our herbicide treatments more efficient. Because otherwise, we'd be spraying on thatch and dead plants, and our herbicide would just go to waste. Our herbicide, the, the only herbicide we used was. Um, a herbicide called Aquavit, which is a generic rodeo, which is a aquatic glyphosate. Um, it's fairly cheaper than Roundup, and we save a lot of money. But we uh, either used a boom spray or a backpack sprayer, and at one point we used an aerial spray because there was many acres that had learned to use an aerial spray of glyphosate on these on these um, deep rooted sedge populations. And it knocked it down and it, it killed a lot of it. There's still a lot left in some of the drainages which we have to treat. But it killed a lot of it. So after three years, we let that fuel load come up again because the cattle are off, more 
even the non-native grasses started growing, started uh, filling up and giving us a good fuel layer for a burn. So after three years, we decided to put a burn on it, but we wanted to do that. The only time we could do it is in, in the winter months because we, because the, the smoke had to go to the, to the south, so we had to use, needed a, a north burn. We also needed a, the grass to be dead from a hard frost, and we got all those conditions about four years ago, and with, with 25% humidity. So we went in there, we ran a burn along 800 acres, and it was like a moonscape. We totally knocked out everything, burned it to the ground, 800 acres. Of course, it didn't kill the food it said. That came back within three months. It looked like it never was burned in, in, at all. But what it did was put, uh, allow fresh growth to come up, and that meant more leaf surface, more fresh leaf surface for our herbicide treatment. So we didn't waste a lot on dig, on dig growth. So once we knocked out that, sprayed the food through the sedge again, we, we felt it was time, there was enough um, open space from the burn to, and more, um, in May, which is a little late, but we decided to purchase those bales at the Nash Prairie. And I thank Aaron and Nash Prairie for getting us those bales four or five years ago and last December. And we used a bale buster, which you'll see by the demonstration. Each bale, we probably covered about half an acre. Doesn't seem like much, but it threw a lot of it threw a lot of that native prairie and seed all over the place, scattered, wind blown it. And so just even the hay that got thrown down, the seeds went scattering everywhere, the wind blew them everywhere. And so we did this about five years ago. 30 started with 30 bales. And this year I went out there in May, I also went out there last week, but May I went where we uh, walked around where we did the bales and it was like night and day. I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, but it was several acres of uh, brown seed pass down coming up, ready to seed out where there was never any before. And a lot of the uh, non-natives we were like our um, paragraine windmill grass, which you'll see in a lot of decreased fields. They were getting, they were starting to get knocked down, or, you know, covered up by the brown seed pass down. There was also a lot of forbs that you normally couldn't buy um, from seed companies in bulk as much. The expensive Rattlesnake Master, um, Kansas, Blazing Star, which you can't buy, but we got it cheaper from the, from the seed. It started coming up in our, our areas. Uh, many um, types of forbs that you won't find at a, at a dealership we were getting that, on that prairie where we burned and where we put the hay down. And it was coming up in other places too because we not took the, the prairie, put it in rest from cattle, and the, um, it started, the prairie started uh, rehabilitating itself. It started getting healthy. So we thought, okay, this is working. So let's try this at our other unit, Eagle Nest Lake, which is probably even more degraded when we got it. And we, again, we bought at least 80 bales. We still got a few more on there. 80 to 100 bales, we did the same thing. But let me tell you, we're not going to, you're not going to, if you all do this on your own, don't think this, we've heard before, don't expect anything in the first two years. And um, we, this, this, uh, gra this, uh, these grass came up after about three to four years. We started noticing um, the a good amount of native grasses from the Nash Prairie coming in with the seed, the seed bank, and also from seeds that were probably already there. So um, we um, we put this on Eagle Nest Lake. We did it after another burn. Some of you may not have the luxury of burning, so we we put this. We wanted to do it in February. We thought that was the best time to start throwing seed down or the hay down to let the seeds get established. Um, these seeds were, they came from the prairie. The, most of them were taller grasses because they were cut in November. And that means little blue stem because new blue stem matures in November. Probably spike trisetum, rattlesnake master, all these tall grasses, they're going to be caught up in the, in the, um, in the baling process. But there also is going to be a lot of seeds that get taken up with it just from the ground, just from the actions of, of baling. 
And um, what we did, we came out there, we, not, we uh, shredded another 80 bales, just took it out there and found a high ground and, and shredded everywhere. And like I said, we're not gonna, we're just gonna leave it alone because we don't have the time and uh, personnel to go out there and check it every week. So we left it alone, but we, we, uh, the blood you don't want to take from this is going to be quick. If you're going to start scattering hay like this from good prairie, make sure you get it from a, do an inventory of the land you're going to, you're going to grab the bales from. It could be square bales. Make sure that a significant part of it is going to be native, or else you're going to start getting back to where you started. Also, start, I would put it in there at the latest, if you can, the very latest March, but preferably January and February. Start throwing that, start throwing this band. in December, actually, when you get it. December through February, I suggest you start putting that, you start scattering the hay down. And that goes with any seed collection. Just stay, you get, go out there and just start throwing it in. Don't do it in the seeds in the summertime. That way you get you might get some winter rains, it's cooler, the ground's gonna be a little wetter, you might start some germination. So um I talk quick and that's that's what we did. It's it's not it's not rocket science, it's just we thought this is gonna work and it, and it's so far it is. And these are uh, prairies, our upland prairies, they're like soils as you saw on that demonstration table. They're a little bit more sandy alone. I don't know if they're gonna work on more clay place type soils, but give it a try. Any questions? Can you, can you use uh, what we just saw, the seeding with the seed drill, in combination with bale busting? Yeah, if you can, uh, if you can get the time and you, people right there. Uh, like I said, this our units were very far away. And we just don't have the the time and the management to get out there all the time. But if we could watch it, the seed and the, and the seed drilling would work too. But uh, also with the seeds, um, if you're gonna, if you can't, if you can get seeds, I, I, you all may know this, but you definitely need to get more ecotype seeds. That means my, um, seeds of the sphere, of the seeds that grew here that are more adapted to these coastal environments. You get a seed from Oklahoma or the more higher Midwest, they're probably not gonna, they're probably not gonna germinate. They're probably, or they're gonna be sickly, and they're just not gonna get going. Yes. I didn't do the actual cutting. Did you know, Aaron? Uh, what was the question? <laughs> how high? <laughs> the question was how high we we cut the the uh, cut for the, the hay. Um, we had a, a local uh, guy do the cutting, um, and actually it was the guy that had been been cutting there for for years and years before that. And uh, I think it was around three inches. Was was what it ended up being? It was a sickle, uh, a sickle cutter. I'm sorry. What was that? Uh, so cut it. Say cut it high, and then yeah. Uh, that, I mean that's possible. Um, we we prefer to um, just cut everything up, and, and uh, it seems to, to simulate a, a fire. It gives a better disturbance uh, when you do it that way, I think. And, and the results this year were really good. Um, so we, we cut it about two or three inches last year. This year, that came up to solid brown seed pastalum. Uh, you can see rattlesnake master, the, the Indian blanket, all. all Uh, we're going to continue to do to do some level of, of cutting and bailing out there at Geo. We prefer to do it for conservation purposes, and that, that's why this agreement with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service was so appealing to us. Uh, it, it allowed us to use the hay, uh, you know, to further restoration uh, in that area uh, and around here potentially. Uh, so it really fit well with our goals, and, and we're, we want to continue to do some of that. Uh, every year as, as a demand. Demand will kind of dictate, I think, how much we do. Um, if Fish and Wildlife Service can use 100 bales every year, you know, we'll, we'll try to produce 100 bales every year. Uh, and if, if other folks, you know, find that one, want to use bales from there, uh, you know, I think we can, uh, we can produce quite a bit. Uh, that's a very productive system, especially in these normal or near normal rainfall years. Uh, I think we've got 
I want to say about seven bales an acre off of that last year average. And that's those are those big round bales you're seeing out there. So that's that's quite a bit of uh, you know seven nine to nine thousand pounds of of uh, biomass you know we get off of there. So it was it was predominantly I think we hay in November, predominantly maybe late October. Uh, it was a lot, a lot of little blue stem, some split beard, um, a little bit of a little bit of everything really, but uh, split beard, little blue stem, um, you know, lots of Indian grass last year. So. Um, so that's what, in those two bales that we'll be using uh, here in a little bit, that's where that, they come from. Um, we we hauled them over here uh, a couple weeks, last week, I guess. Uh, the area that we'll be planting, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of background, uh, it's, we wanted to, to, to demonstrate the, this, this technique, so we figured, well, let's, you know, we'll do a little experiment while we're at it. Um, the area where we'll be going, that whole area you'll see out there, which is a lot of smut grass and, and the, uh, you know, this, this annual sump weed, the annulus, uh, that was solid deep rooted sedge uh, last year. Solid. I mean, it was, you couldn't get a more, if you tried to grow it, you couldn't get a more solid stand of that stuff. <laughs> and it was about you know, three feet high. And uh, we, we hit that with um, the highest rate we could. Uh, of glyphosate, um, and it, and, and we did that in the fall. I think it was October. Tim, you, you did it twice. Did it twice. Hold it, spray it, let it go back a little bit, and did it again. Okay. So yeah, there was some pretty, you know, we 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 went the nuclear option on it because <laughs> it was it was uh, solid. Said we weren't. We weren't miss, we weren't hitting much else. There was no uh, very little uh, um, collateral damage there. What what was that? We went the max. I think it's uh, what, 48 ounces an acre or 64 maybe whatever that max. I go, I go by tank, 50 gallon tank, 90 ounces, but I use aqua and a small surfactant, a little bit of surfactant, but not too much because you're gunned up. They've been using uh, methyl seed oil, which we'll probably go to because it doesn't tend to come up. Uh, our hoses and our, and our little uh, metal mesh filters as much. We we'll probably go that round. Yeah. So we we did that last year. Finished that last fall. Uh, it looked dead. I mean, it looked brown, brown. And uh, I thought we got it. You know. And uh, all all through this year, it, you had the, the late. Uh, it stayed cooler later this this year, and uh, it looked brown and dead for a long, long time. In about mid June. Finally, was uh, was when it finally started coming back. There's you know a few seedlings. I think some came back from rhizomes, um, but you'll be out. You can, when we get out there, you'll take a look on the ground. You'll see what's come back. Um, and then just last week, it was earlier this week. I finished with the backpack sprayer. I went out there and just sprayed all all the little plants coming up again. So even though you'll see it out there, it's probably dying right now. It's it's taking in the chemical. And, it takes a long time for that to die. It, it's like a month, you know, three weeks. And everything around, you see a brown patch around it, and the sedge will still be dying. And a couple weeks later, it'll finally die. So it takes a long time for that to translocate. But uh, so that's what we did. We, we you know, spot sprayed it here a couple weeks ago to kind of prepare it. We'll see what happens. Um, I kind of shared Thomas's uh, skepticism. You know, it's not the right time of year. It may not be the right species, but we'll see. Uh, the cows are out there right now, so we'll we'll let them uh, in their normal rotation be out there for a while. I don't think it'll hurt anything. Probably, if anything, they'll stomp it in. You know, hopefully get those, that seed to soil contact. Um, once they get out of there, if we start seeing, we'll monitor. If we start seeing stuff come up, uh, we'll we'll get a little electric fence around it and keep the cows out of it for a while. So that's the that's the plan on that that little sliding. We tried, the only thing we tried is plateau, which is right across the fence. We didn't, so far it hasn't, it's kind of made it sick, but it hasn't really. Um, we tried, uh, 2,4-D in my camera before, which is again, you know, 2,4-D in general is, is uh, 
is a real harsh chemical. Uh, it's a restricted chemical as well, so it's, it's really uh, the less you can use of that, the better. Um, and it did some, you know, it, it did a little bit of, of uh, worked a little bit on, on this edge. Uh, but I found if you're if it's to the point where you need to use herbicide, I found you know, the cheapest, most efficient glyphosate. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have any other recommendations or if you've seen any success with other things, let me know. I'd love to you know, get the information from you later. Yeah. That's one story. Like Aaron, we had to use the nuclear option because we described it was what we found in our prairies too. And um, we didn't worry about collateral damage because there, there, there probably wasn't any other thing there. And, um, we're still going to come back this summer and hit it again. It, it likes the deeper sedge, likes also ditches, these man-made ditches. We're going to hit that, and um, once it goes down, treat it again, and then leave it alone. Yes. You lay those, how many bales per acre do you lay down? <clears throat> per acre. It's looking like we're doing um, two bales per acre. Two bales per acre. Now, I can, it depends how fast you want to go, how slow you want to go. You can adjust that. It's a premier bale buster. There's, I'm sure there's other brands that make bale busters. We got this from Adwater. Water. Weird. It's. So that's about what you put out there. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the speed set for now, but it looks like we are doing you know, the way it was going a couple of months ago. About it looks like we are knocking a half acre per bale. Okay. Those big brown ones? Yeah, it's in. It's in there right now. I can't, I can't tell you that because we borrowed ours from at, at water. It's probably the only one in the fish and wildlife on this side of the coast. Jim Willis said that he has a square bale buster that he can rent out from Wildlife Habitat Federation. You find a good stretch of, of prairie that you can cut, mow. One thing in the bowling it will simulate a burn to a point. We'll take off that thatch layer and open it up a little bit. And um, you need to get all a little blue stem for a time. I mean, you're going to pick up other stuff too. How much would a, one of those large bales of hay cost if you purchased it from Nash or another associated place like that? Uh, the current market right now is it's drying up, so I think. Uh, 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 to buy for cattle, uh, you're looking around forty-five to fifty dollars a bale right now in this area. Um, we uh, it, we try to keep in, in line with the market as much as we can. Uh, now we do work with partners, uh, and we, it's not necessarily we have to. It's not a money-making deal for us by any means. So uh, we do try to recoup our costs and uh, try to make that affordable, especially if it's going to be used for conservation. That's uh, something we try to promote. So. It's our, in our interest to uh, to make sure to facilitate that, and so um, you know it's forty five dollars a bale if you were going to uh, purchase it on the market. Um, if you're looking uh, to do some conservation, you know we can uh, just come talk to me. Might be able to work something out uh, with, with your budget. So. One questions? Okay. Have a set of instructions to uh, to use. Uh, so kind of kind of trial by error, and it didn't. It doesn't take very long to, to set up. It there's not much calibration. There's a couple a couple deals here. What takes the time is in is and and the biggest part of that this whole operation, the the logistics of getting your bales to the right location where you're going to do the planning, get them you know, offloaded off trucks and moving them here, moving them there where you need to go. And uh, of course, prior to that, before that, you've had to plan, we, we planned the burn a year out in advance. And, and uh, we, we had to wait for a uh, for north wind with uh, lower humidities after a freeze. So we're later in the year and fighting, trying to get fire breaks in, of course, or maintained. Uh, the actual operation of getting the burn done, burns can be tricky, you know, if 
you don't have the weather, you can't do the burn. So once you get to the point of the, of the planting, it, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, you know, you're looking, you're looking good on the day of the planting. Really, this, this, the hopper here, just the best luck we found is, is having it in the wide open position. And then um, there's another adjustment here that uh, there's some, there's a, there's a rack, the rack in there that, that holds the bale up. So it's not just sitting right down on the, uh, on the blades itself. And, um, and what we found was, is that with these bells, they're, they're, they're packed a little loose that we needed to keep it up as, as, as high as we can. Cause you'll see when you get going, there'll be times when it'll slough off, parts of it will bail will slough off and it'll go right there in there and you'll, you'll, you'll kick it out pretty quick, which will, uh, which will leave a, uh, a mat of, of grass, which we which we tried not to do. We're trying to trying to spread it out, you know, get it getting it out so that it can fall down, and, you know, get that uh, that seed to soil uh, connection there. Of course. Um, so yeah, just just setting setting this up is 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 of course making sure you have the the the, the, the tractor uh, to uh, that can run the machine itself. Uh, which you don't need this size of a tractor, of course, it, it, can, it can be run on a little smaller tractor. <laughs> but, uh, anyhow. Uh, any other questions on, on the Bell Buster itself? So how are you getting the hay in there? Yeah. The, the Bell Buster has a set of forks back here Steroids. that come down. And then you just back up to the bale and then it flips it in. Uh. Okay, and then what happens inside here, you've got the, the main blades that, that spin, spin and, and fling the, the hay out. Uh, but in, also in there, you've got two augers that you can roll back and forth to help move your load around. And if you're doing this yourself, that's where, that's where getting to play with it, and that's where you'll figure out, you know, what speed you need to go, uh, how far you're how far you're throwing it so when you're making your turns to come back you know where you need to be to make sure you're covering the ground if you, you don't want a good even I mean you could sit there and you could shred this whole bell and we'd have a pile of hay right here if you wanted I mean it and it pretty quick too so what are some safety precautions when you're working around something like this of course y'all are standing right where you shouldn't <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in, anywhere, of course, anytime you work around PTOs, power takeoffs, and, and that kind of stuff, you know this this is a this is a this is a very dangerous area on here. Of course, this area here, and then also the operator's vision back here when he's backing up can't see can't see too much. I can't you can't see the the uh, forks when they're down. About all you can see is about uh, about a foot the top foot of that bale. So. Um, the strings are off the bells themselves, primarily. So we, we, we'll, we usually clean that out. We, we've busted a couple before we come up. We'll clean it up afterwards. We go in there and cut the strings off. When you bust our bush, yeah, it, yeah, it's tied together with twine. No, it, it just, we just put it in there. It'll come apart by itself. Any other questions? Quite a bit of string ends up out on your prairie as well. There, there is some string that does end up on the prairie. Okay. Plenty of power. I can't speak for a smaller tractor. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think. We do. We do. We clean it all. No, we do. A lot of times we do. Sometimes.